Chapter Twelve of the Interesting Narrative of the Life of Olada Aquiano. By Olada Aquiano. Chapter Twelve. Different transactions of the author's life till the present time. His application to the late Bishop of London to be appointed a missionary to Africa. Some account of his share in the conduct of the late expedition to Sierra Leone. Petition to the Queen. Conclusion. Such were the various scenes which I was a witness to, and the fortune I experienced until the year 1777. Since that period my life has been more uniform, and the incidents of it fewer, than any other equal number of years preceding. I therefore hastened to the conclusion of a narrative, which I fear the reader may think already sufficiently tedious. I had suffered so many impositions in my commercial transactions in different parts of the world, that I became heartily disgusted with the seafaring life, and I was determined not to return to it, at least for some time. I therefore once more engaged in service shortly after my return, and continued for the most part in this situation until 1784. Soon after my arrival in London, I saw a remarkable circumstance relative to African complexion, which I thought so extraordinary that I beg leave just to mention it. A white negro woman that I had formerly seen in London and other parts had married a white man, by whom she had three boys, and they were every one mulattoes, and yet they had fine light hair. In 1779 I served Governor McNamara, who had been a considerable time on the coast of Africa. In the time of my service I used to ask frequently other servants to join me in family prayers, but this only excited their mockery. However, the governor, understanding that I was of a religious turn, wished to know of what religion I was. I told him I was a Protestant of the Church of England, agreeable to the thirty-nine articles of that church, and that, whomsoever I found to preach according to that doctrine, those I would hear. A few days after this we had some more discourse on the same subject. The governor spoke to me on it again, and said that he would, if I chose, as he thought I might be of service in converting my countrymen to the gospel faith, get me sent out as a missionary to Africa. I at first refused going and told him how I had been served, on the like occasion, by some white people the last voyage I went to Jamaica, when I attempted, if it were the will of God, to be the means of converting the Indian prince, and I said, I supposed they would serve me worse than Alexander the coppersmith did St. Paul, if I should attempt to go amongst them in Africa. He told me not to fear, he would apply to the Bishop of London to get me ordained. On these terms I consented to the Governor's proposal to go to Africa, in hope of doing good, if possible, amongst my countrymen. So, in order to have me sent out properly, we immediately wrote the following letters to the late Bishop of London. To the Right Reverend Father in God, Robert, Lord Bishop of London, the memorial of Gustavus Vassa, showeth that your memorialist is a native of Africa, and has a knowledge of the manners and customs of the inhabitants of that country, that your memorialist has resided in different parts of Europe for twenty-two years last past, and embraced the Christian faith in the year 1759, that your memorialist is desirous of returning to Africa as a missionary, if encouraged by your lordship, in hopes of being able to prevail upon his countrymen to become Christians. And your memorialist is the more induced to undertake the same, from the success that has attended the like undertakings when encouraged by the Portuguese, through their different settlements off the coast of Africa, and also by the Dutch. Both governments encouraging the blacks, who, by their education, are qualified to undertake the same, and are found more proper than European clergymen, unacquainted with the language and customs of the country. Your memorialist's only motive for soliciting the office of a missionary is, 
that he may by a means, under God, of reforming his countrymen and persuading them to embrace the Christian religion. Therefore your memorialist humbly prays your lordship's encouragement and support in the undertaking. Gustavus Vassar, at Mr. Guthrie's, Taylor, number 17, Hedge Lane. My lord, I have resided near seven years on the coast of Africa, for most part of the time as commanding officer. From the knowledge I have of the country and its inhabitants, I am inclined to think that the within plan will be attended with great success, if countenanced by your lordship. I beg leave further to represent to your lordship that the like attempts, when encouraged by other governments, have met with uncommon success. And, at this very time, I know a very respectable character, a black priest at Cape Coast Castle. I know the within-named Gustavus Vassar, and believe him a moral good man. I have the honour to be, my lord, your lordship's humble and obedient servant, Matt McNamara, Grove, 11th March, 1779. This letter was also accompanied by the following, from Dr. Wallace, who had resided in Africa for many years, and whose sentiments on the subject of an African mission were the same with Governor McNamara's. March 13th, 1779. My Lord, I have resided near five years on Senegambia, on the coast of Africa, and have had the honour of filling very considerable employments in that province. I do approve of the within plan, and think the undertaking very laudable and proper, and that it deserves your lordship's protection and encouragement, in which case it must be attended with the intended success. I am, my lord, your lordship's humble and obedient servant. Thomas Wallace. With these letters I waited on the bishop by the governor's desire, and presented them to his lordship. He received me with much condescension and politeness, but, from some certain scruples of delicacy, declined to ordain me. My sole motive for thus dwelling on this transaction, or inserting these papers, is the opinion which gentlemen of sense and education who are acquainted with Africa, entertain of the probability of converting the inhabitants of it to the faith of Jesus Christ, if the attempt were countenanced by the legislator. Shortly after this I left the governor, and served a nobleman in the Devonshire militia, with whom I was encamped at Cox Heath for some time. But the operations there were too minute and uninteresting to make a detail of. In the year 1783 I visited eight counties in Wales, from motives of curiosity. While I was in that part of the country, I was led to go down into a coal-pit in Shropshire, but my curiosity nearly cost me my life. For while I was in the pit the coals fell in, and buried one poor man who was not far from me. Upon this I got out as fast as I could, thinking the surface of the earth the safest part of it. In the spring, 1784, I thought of visiting Old Ocean again. In consequence of this I embarked as a steward on board a fine new ship called the London, commanded by Martin Hopkin, and sailed for New York. I admired this city very much. It is large and well built, and abounds with provisions of all kinds. While we lay here, a circumstance happened which I thought extremely singular. One day a malefactor was to be executed on a gallows, but with a condition that if any woman, having nothing on her but a shift, married the man under the gallows, his life was to be saved. This extraordinary privilege was claimed. A woman presented herself, and the marriage ceremony was performed. Our ship, having got laden, we returned to London in January 1785. When she was ready again for another voyage, the captain, being an agreeable man, I sailed with him from hence in the spring, March 1785, for Philadelphia. On the 5th of April we took our departure from Land's End, with a pleasant gale, 
and about nine o'clock that night the moon shone bright, and the sea was smooth, while our ship was going free by the wind, at the rate of about four or five miles an hour. At this time another ship was going nearly as fast as we on the opposite point, meeting us right in the teeth. Yet none on board observed either ship until we struck each other forcibly, head and head, to the astonishment and consternation of both crews. She did as much damage, but I believe we did her more. For when we passed by each other, which we did very quickly, they called to us to bring to and hoist out our boat, but we had enough to do to mind ourselves. And in about eight minutes we saw no more of her. We refitted as well as we could the next day, and proceeded on our voyage, and in May arrived at Philadelphia. I was very glad to see this favourite old town once more, and my pleasure was much increased in seeing the worthy Quakers freeing and easing the burdens of many of my oppressed African brethren. It rejoiced my heart when one of these friendly people took me to see a free school they had erected for every denomination of black people, whose minds are cultivated here and forwarded to virtue, and thus they are made useful members of the community. Does not the success of this practice say loudly to the planters in the language of Scripture, Go ye and do likewise? In October 1785 I was accompanied by some of the Africans, and presented this address of thanks to the gentlemen called Friends or Quakers, in Grace Church Court, Lombard Street. Gentlemen, by reading your book entitled A Caution to Great Britain and Her Colonies, concerning the calamitous state of the enslaved negroes. We, the poor, oppressed, needy, and much degraded negroes, desire to approach you with this address of thanks, with our innermost love and warmest acknowledgement, and with the deepest sense of your benevolence, unwearied labour, and kind interposition, towards breaking the yoke of slavery, and to administer a little comfort and ease, to thousands and tens of thousands of very grievously afflicted and too heavy burthened negroes. Gentlemen, could you, by perseverance, at last be enabled, under God, to lighten in any degree the heavy burthen of the afflicted? No doubt it would, in some measure, be the possible means, under God, of saving the souls of many of the oppressors, and, if so, Sure we are that the God, whose eyes are ever upon all his creatures, and always rewards every true act of virtue, and regards the prayers of the oppressed, will give to you and yours those blessings which are not in our power to express or conceive, but which we, as a part of those captive, oppressed, and afflicted people, most earnestly wish and pray for. These gentlemen received us very kindly with a promise to exert themselves on behalf of the oppressed Africans, and we parted. While I was in town, I chanced once to be invited to a Quaker's wedding. The simple and yet expressive mode used at their solemnizations is worthy of note. The following is the true form of it. After the company have met, they have seasonable exhortations by several of the members. The bride and bridegroom stand up, and taking each other by the hand in a solemn manner, the man orderly declares to this purpose. Friends, in the fear of the Lord, and in the presence of this assembly, who I desire to be my witnesses, I take this my friend, M. N., to be my wife, promising through divine assistance to be unto her a loving and faithful husband, till death separate us and the woman makes the like declaration. Then the two first sign their names to the record, and as many more witnesses as have a mind. I had the honour to subscribe mine to a register in Grace Church Court, Lombard Street. We returned to London in August, and our ship not going immediately to sea, I shipped as a steward in an American ship called the Harmony, Captain John Willett and left London in March 1786, bound to Philadelphia. Eleven days after sailing we carried our foremast away, 
we had a nine weeks passage which caused our trip not to succeed well the market for our goods proving bad and to make it worse my commander began to play me the like tricks as others too often practice on free negroes in the west indies but i thank god i found many friends here who in some measure prevented him on my return to london in august i was very agreeably surprised to find that the benevolence of government had adopted the plan of some philanthropic individuals to send the africans from hence to their native quarter and that some vessels were then engaged to carry them to sierra leone an act which redounded to the honour of all concerned in its promotion and filled me with prayers and much rejoicing there was then in the city a select committee of gentlemen for the black poor to some of whom i had the honour of being known and as soon as they heard of my arrival they sent for me to the committee when i came there they informed me of the intention of government and as they seemed to think me qualified to superintend part of the undertaking they asked me to go with the black poor to africa i pointed out to them many objections to my going and particularly expressed some difficulties in account of the slave dealers as i would certainly oppose their traffic in the human species by every means in my power however these objections were overruled by the gentlemen of the committee who prevailed on me to go and recommended me to the honourable commissioners of his majesty's navy as a proper person to act as commissary for government in the intended expedition and they accordingly appointed me in november seventeen eighty six to that office and gave me sufficient power to act for the government in the capacitary of commissary having received my warrant and the following order by the principal officers and commissaries of his majesty's navy whereas you were directed by our warrant of the fourth of last month to receive into your charge from mr irving the surplus provisions remaining of what was provided for the voyage as well as the provisions for the support of the black poor after landing at sierra leone with the clothing tools and all other articles provided at government's expense and as the provisions were laid in at a rate of two months for the voyage and for four months after the landing but the number embarked being so much less than was expected whereby there may be a considerable surplus of provisions clothing etc these are in addition to former orders to direct and require you to appropriate or dispose of such surplus to the best advantage you can for the benefit of government keeping and rendering to us a faithful account of what you do herein and for your guidance in preventing any white persons going who are not intended to have the indulgences of being carried thither we send you herewith a list of those recommended by the committee for the black poor as proper persons to be permitted to embark and acquaint you that you are not to suffer any others to go who do not produce a certificate from the committee for the black poor or their having their permission for it for which this shall be your warrant dated at the navy office january sixteenth seventeen eighty seven j hinslow g o marsh w palmer to mr gustavus vassar commissary of provisions and stores for the black poor going to sierra leone i proceeded immediately to the execution of my duty on board the vessels destined for the voyage where i continued till the march following during my continuance in the employment of government i was struck with the flagrant abuses committed by the agent and endeavoured to remedy them but without effect one instance among many which i could produce may serve as a specimen government had ordered to be provided all necessaries slops as they are called included for seven hundred and fifty persons however not being able to muster more than four hundred and twenty six i was ordered to send the superfluous slops etc to the king's stores at portsmouth but when i demanded them for that purpose from the agent it appeared they had never been bought though paid for by the government but that was not all government were not only the objects of peculiation 
these poor people suffered infinitely more. Their accommodations were most wretched. Many of them wanted beds, and many more clothing and other necessaries. For the truth of this, and much more, I do not seek credit for my own assertion. I appeal to the testimony of Captain Thompson, of the Nautilus who conveyed us, to whom I applied in February 1787 for a remedy, when I had remonstrated to the agent in vain, and even brought him to be a witness of the injustice and oppression I complained of. I appeal also to a letter written by these wretched people, so early as the beginning of the preceding January, and published in the Morning Herald of the fourth of that month, signed by twenty of their chiefs. I could not silently suffer government to be thus cheated, and my countrymen plundered and oppressed, and even left destitute of the necessaries for almost their existence. I therefore informed the commissioners of the navy of the agent's proceeding, but my dismission was soon after procured by means of a gentleman in the city, whom the agent, conscious of his peculiation, had deceived by letter and whom, moreover, empowered the same agent to receive on board, at the government expense, a number of persons as passengers, contrary to the orders I received. By this I suffered a considerable loss in my property. However, the commissioners were satisfied with my conduct, and wrote to Captain Thompson expressing their approbation of it. Thus provided, they proceeded on their voyage, and at last, worn out by treatment, perhaps not the most mild, and wasted by sickness, brought on by want of medicine, clothes, beddings, etc., they reached Sierra Leone, just at the commencement of the rains. At that season of the year it is impossible to cultivate the lands. Their provisions, therefore, were exhausted before they could derive any benefit from agriculture, and it is not surprising that many especially the Lascars, whose constitutions are very tender, and who had been cooped up in ships from October to June, and accommodated in the manner I have mentioned, should be so wasted by their confinement as not long to survive it. Thus ended my part in the long-talked-of expedition to Sierra Leone, an expedition which, however unfortunate in the event, was humane and politic in its design. Nor was it a failure owing to government. Everything was done on their part, but there was evidently sufficient mismanagement attending the conduct and execution of it to defeat its success. I should not have been so ample in my account of this transaction, had not the share I borne in it been made the subject of partial animadversion. And even my dismission from my employment thought worthy of being made by some a matter of public triumph. The motives which might influence any person to descend to a petty contest with an obscure African, and to seek gratification by his depression, perhaps it is not proper here to inquire into or relate, even if its detection were necessary to my vindication. But I thank heaven it is not. I wish to stand by my own integrity, and not to shelter myself under the improperty of another. And I trust the behaviour of the commissioners of the navy to me entitle me to make this assertion. For after I had been dismissed, March 24th, I drew up a memorial thus, to the right honourable, the Lord's Commissioners of His Majesty's Treasury. The memorial and petition of Gustavus Vassa, a black man, late commissary to the black poor going to Africa. Humbly sheweth that your lordship's memorialist was, by the honourable the commissioners of his majesty's navy, being one of the ships appointed to proceed to Africa with the above poor. That your memorialist, to his great grief and astonishment, received a letter of dismission from the Honourable Commissioners of the Navy, by your Lordship's orders. And the greatest assiduity in discharging the trust reposed in him, he is altogether at a loss to conceive the reasons 
of your lordship's having altered the favourable opinion you were pleased to conceive of him. Sensible that your lordship's would not proceed to so severe a measure without some apparent good cause. He therefore has every reason to believe that his conduct has been grossly misinterpreted to your lordship's. And he is the more confirmed in his opinion, because, by opposing measures of others concerned in the same expedition, which tended to defeat your lordship's humane intentions, and to put the government to a very considerable additional expense, he created a number of enemies, whose misrepresentations he has too much reason to believe laid the foundation of his dismission. Unsupported by friends, and unaided by the advantages of a liberal education, he can only hope for redress from the justice of his cause. In addition to the mortification of having been removed from his employment, and the advantage which he reasonably might have expected to have derived therefrom, he has had the misfortune to have sunk a considerable part of his little property in fitting himself out, and in other expenses arising out of his situation, on account of where he here annexes. Your memorialist will not trouble your lordships with a vindication of any part of his conduct, because he knows not of what crimes he is accused. He, however, earnestly entreats that you will be pleased to direct an inquiry into his behaviour during the time he acted in the public service. And, if it be found that his dismission arose from false representations, he is confident that in your lordship's justice he shall find redress. Your petitioner therefore humbly prays that your lordship will take his case into consideration, and that you will be pleased to order payment of the above referred to account, amounting to thirty-two lira and four shillings, and also the wages intended, which is most humbly submitted. London, May twelfth, 1787 The above petition was delivered into the hands of their lordships, who were kind enough, in the space of some few months afterwards, without hearing, to order me fifty lira sterling, that is, eighteen lira wages for the time, upwards of four months, I acted a faithful part in their service. Certainly the sum is more than a free negro would have had in the western colonies. March the 21st, 1788 I had the honour of presenting the Queen with a petition on behalf of my African brethren, which was received most graciously by Her Majesty. To the Queen's Most Excellent Majesty Madam, Your Majesty's well-known benevolence and humanity emboldens me to approach your royal presence, trusting that the obscurity of my situation will not prevent Your Majesty from attending to the sufferings for which I plead. Yet I do not solicit your royal pity for my own distress, my sufferings, although numerous, are in a measure forgotten. I supplicate your Majesty's compassion for millions of my African countrymen, who groan under the lash of tyranny in the West Indies. The oppression and cruelty exercised to the unhappy Negroes there have at length reached the British legislature, and they are now deliberating on its redress. Even several persons of property and slaves in the West Indies have petitioned Parliament against its continuance. Sensible that it is as impolitic as it is unjust, and what is inhumane must ever be unwise. Your Majesty's reign has been hitherto distinguished by private acts of benevolence and bounty. Surely the more extended the misery is, the greater claim it has to Your Majesty's compassion, and the greater must be Your Majesty's pleasure in administering to its relief. I presume, therefore, gracious Queen, to implore your interposition with your royal consort, in favour of the wretched Africans, that, by your Majesty's benevolent influence, a period may now be put to their misery, and that they may be raised from the condition of brutes, to which they are at present degraded, to the rights and situation of freemen, and admitted to partake of the blessings of your Majesty's happy government." so shall your majesty enjoy the heartfelt pleasure of procuring happiness to millions, 
and be rewarded in the grateful prayers of themselves and of their posterity. And may the all-bountiful Creator shower on your majesty and the royal family every blessing that to this world can afford, and every fullness of joy which divine revelation has promised us in the next. I am your majesty's most dutiful and devoted servant to command. Gustavus Vassa, the oppressed Ethiopian. Number 53, Baldwin's Gardens The Negro Consolidated Act, made by the Assembly of Jamaica last year, and the new Act of Amendment now in agitation there, contain a proof of the existence of those charges that have been made against the planters, relative to the treatment of their slaves. I hope to have the satisfaction of seeing the renovation of liberty and justice resting on the British Government to vindicate the honour of our common nature. These are concerns which do not perhaps belong to any particular office. But, to speak more seriously to every man of sentiment, actions like these are the just and sure foundation of future fame. A reversion, though remote, is coveted by some noble minds as a substantial good. It is upon these grounds that I hope and expect the attention of gentlemen in power. These are designs consonant to the elevation of their rank, and the dignity of their stations. They are ends suitable to the nature of a free and generous government, and connected with views of empire and dominion, suited to the benevolence and solid merit of the legislator. It is a pursuit of substantial greatness, may the time come, at least a speculation to me is pleasing. When the sable people shall gratefully commemorate the auspicious era of extensive freedom. Then shall those persons particularly be named with praise and honour, who generously proposed and stood forth in the case of humanity, liberty, and good policy, and brought to the ear of the legislator designs worthy of royal patronage and adoption. May heaven make the British senators the dispersers of light, liberty, and science to the uttermost parts of the earth. Then will be glory to God on the highest, on earth peace and good will to men. Glory, honour, peace, etc., to every soul of man that worketh good, to the Britons first, because to them the gospel is preached, and also to the nations. Those that honour their Maker have mercy on the poor. It is righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is reproach to any people. Destruction shall be to the workers of iniquity, and the wicked shall fall by their own wickedness. May the blessings of the Lord be upon the heads of those who commiserated the case of the oppressed Negroes, and the fear of God prolong their days, and may their expectations be filled with gladness. The liberal devise liberal things, and by liberal things shall stand. Isaiah 32, 8 They can say with pious Job, Did not I weep for him that was in trouble? Was not my soul grieved for the poor? Job thirty twenty five. As the inhuman traffic of slavery is to be taken into consideration of the British legislator, I doubt not if a system of commerce was established in Africa. The demand for manufacturers would most rapidly augment, as the native inhabitants will insensibly adopt the British fashions, manners, customs, etc., in proportion to the civilization. So will be the consumption of British manufacturers. The wear and tear of a continent nearly twice as large as Europe, and rich in vegetable and mineral productions, is much easier conceived than calculated. A case in point. It cost the Aborigines of Britain little or nothing in clothing, etc. The difference between their forefathers and the present generation in point of consumption is literally infinite. The supposition is most obvious. It will be equally immense in Africa. The same cause, viz. civilization, will ever have the same effect. It is trading upon safe grounds. A commercial intercourse with Africa opens an inexhaustible source of wealth 
to the manufacturing interests of Great Britain, and to all which the slave trade is an objection. If I am not misinformed, the manufacturing interest is equal, if not superior, to the landed interest, as to the value, for reasons which will soon appear. The abolition of slavery, so diabolical, will give a most rapid extension of manufacturers, which is totally and diametrically opposite to what some people assert. The manufacturers of this country must, and will, in the nature and reason of things, have a full and constant employ by supplying the African markets. Population. The bowels and surface of Africa abound in valuable and useful returns. The hidden treasures of centuries will be brought to light and into circulation. Industry, enterprise, and mining will have their full scope, proportionably as they civilize. In a word, it lays open an endless field of commerce to the British manufacturers and merchant adventurer. The manufacturing interest and the general interests are synonymous. The abolition of slavery would be in reality a universal good. Tortures, murder, and every other imaginable barbarity and iniquity are practised upon the poor slaves with impunity. I hope the slave trade will be abolished. I pray it may be an event at hand. The great body of manufacturers, uniting in the cause, will considerably facilitate and expedite it. And, as I have already stated, it is most substantially their interest and advantage, and as such the nations at large, except those persons concerned in the manufacturing, neck yokes, collars, chains, handcuffs, leg bolts, dregs, thumbscrews, iron muzzles, and coffins, cats, scourges, and other instruments of torture used in the slave trade. In a short time one sentiment alone will prevail, from motives of interest as well as justice and humanity. Europe contains one hundred and twenty million inhabitants. Query, how many millions doth Africa contain? Supposing the Africans, collectively and individually, to expend five lira a head in remnant, and furniture yearly when civilized, etc., an immensity beyond the reach of imagination. This I conceive to be a theory founded upon facts, and therefore an infallible one. If the blacks were permitted to remain in their own country, they would double themselves every fifteen years. In proportion to such increase will be the demand for manufacturers. Cotton and indigo grow spontaneously in most parts of Africa. A consideration this of no small consequence to the manufacturing towns of Great Britain. It opens a most immense, glorious, and happy prospect. The clothing, etc., of a continent ten thousand miles in circumference, and immensely rich in productions of every denomination, in return for manufacturers. I have only, therefore, to request the reader's indulgence, and conclude. I am far from the vanity of thinking there is any merit in this narrative. I hope censor will be suspended, when it is considered that it was written by one, who was as unwilling, as unable to adorn the plainness of truth by the colouring of imagination. My life and fortune have been extremely chequered, and my adventures various. Even those I have related are considerably abridged. If any incident in this little work should appear uninteresting and trifling to most readers, I can only say, as my excuse for mentioning it, that almost every event of my life made an impression on my mind, and influenced my conduct. I early accustomed myself to look for the hand of God in the minutest occurrence, and to learn from it a lesson of morality and religion, and in this light every circumstance I have related was to me of importance. After all, what makes an event important, unless by its observation we become better and wiser, and learn to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly before God. To those who are possessed of this spirit, there is scarcely any book or incident so trifling that does not afford some profit, while to others the experience of age seems of no use. 
and even to pour out to them the treasures of wisdom is throwing the jewels of instruction away. The End End of Chapter 12 End of the Interesting Narrative of the Life of Oladu, I. Criano, 